Yes, pain. I mean, we know that newborns feel pain and uh, they're often agitated if they're uncomfortable. Uh, it's okay, keep it with you in the end. The systemic effects of pain and discomfort uh, occur on blood pressure, oxygen, and uh, even the risk of IVH may be more in agitated baby. And uh, you know the pain causes hyperglycemia as well. So the glucose regulation, stress hormones, it impacts all these. So it's essential that as a team, we are sensitive to pain. We educate the nurses and we have a pain scoring on the NICU. It's not done for the sake of JCA or just to score. You make sure they understand why they are looking at pain. So if you explain to them these impacts on the baby, then they are more likely to follow it seriously. And uh, try our best to reduce the pain and discomfort. So we have different measures, clustering of care, avoiding sampling unnecessarily, doing the samples together. I mean, think about if you are taking a blood for any gas, think about any bloods that may be needed the next day or so and do it a bit early if you want. So uh, simple measures, uh, we know cuddling and development friendly care, breastfeeding, mother if she's ready to sit with the baby, breastfeeding is okay during a procedure and uh, sucking with the pacifier if the parents agree for that. Sucrose analgesia, all of you are familiar, but don't use it for just crying babies. Many units start getting into the habit of giving sucrose because baby is irritable. Sucrose is not the remedy for that. And you have to cuddle and comfort the baby. Sucrose is not good for the developing teeth. And uh, in a premature baby, it's a hypertonic solution. So even a risk of NEC is there if you repeatedly do. So be careful with sucrose in a premature baby. You can give it, but there is a limit of up to four times and maximum in 24 hours, six times. 0.5 ml of uh, I don't know if you have the 23 percent sucrose here what do you use it's not probably sweet enough but that's for hyper hypoglycemia 40 percent dextrose so feed and tuck where suitable and uh, choose the minimally invasive and least painful options when you manage and in terms of ventilated babies we now have synchronized ventilation as a norm we discussed yesterday in detail about synchronization and why it avoids uh, having the need to sedate uh, pre-medication for intubation and brief analgesia for painful procedures so we discussed chest drain insertion as a painful procedure intubation pre-medication depends on your unit practice what you use it's preferred to use pre-medication because it's a painful procedure but in the labor room you're not using and in the NICU for insure, for example, if you have a confident team, a senior team who is quick with intubation and who knows not to hurt the baby. So most of the co common uh, injuries happen from pressure on the gums if you are tilting it the wrong way. And the quickness of the procedure, the number of attempts you need. So if you have an inexperienced team, you have a team of uh, medical residents who are going to train, you may need to pre-medicate because you don't want to hurt the baby. And video laryngoscopy is coming up as well in such settings where you uh, visualize and you use that for teaching instead of following them to do it themselves. So video laryngoscopy also helps in experienced hands, but you need to relearn. So it's slightly different. How many of you use video laryngoscopy? You've used. So it's useful and it does uh, need relearning. I mean, the way you approach it is different, but it's useful, especially for non-invasive. If you're using a catheter, uh, you may be able to use it easier. And uh, if it is a labile condition like PPHN, you can use uh, sedation, but not deep sedation again, not paralysis. Uh, remember that when you uh, sedate a baby deeply, you are going to remove the chest wall compliance component. It becomes stiff. The baby has a high compliance chest wall, which is one component which makes the ventilation easier. But if you have a stiff chest wall uh, due to either edema or the baby's effort is taken out, you are going to need more pressures to counter that. And uh, fluid balance is shifted a lot. If you use midazolam especially, uh, the baby becomes edematous. The water logging happens and it affects all the systems. The gut is going to be edematous, your feed tolerance is affected. The baby's chest wall becomes edematous, the diaphragm becomes edematous. So the when you extubate, you may fail more. And because of this, you are going to keep the baby intubated for a longer time. So even in PPHN, I tend to sedate only when the baby is labile for 24 hours or so. Once the baby improves, you quickly wean off and don't use heavy sedation, don't use paralysis. In post-operative pain, you add paracetamol in addition. So you don't need to go to very high doses of morphine. Then you start getting dependency on morphine or fentanyl. You find it difficult to wean them. So try to use paracetamol early and rectal paracetamol can be used or IV paracetamol can be used. And that reduces the need for analgesia. And um, 
in high frequency, as we will discuss, we don't sedate or paralyze as much. We give pain relief. You give a low dose of fentanyl infusion, but you don't sedate them to remove the respiratory effort. <laughs> you want the baby to breathe on top. That's why amplitude adjustment, you don't want the wiggle to overcome the baby's effort. You see the wiggle, that's enough for you. You don't need a very high amplitude. And you are just, now we are talking of volume guarantee in high frequency as well. So you need the baby's effort to help. Morphine infusion is the most commonly used and uh, a low dose used for a short time should not impact. I'm saying should not, we don't know for sure, but the longer duration of treatment, a higher dose definitely impacts. So it affects your neurodevelopment. It has been shown to increase apoptosis in the cerebellum and the long-term outcome is going to be poorer. So you're trying to treat something short-term, which you think might make it easier for you, but it has a long-term impact. And I told you about the prolonged intubation. The study, the Neopain study showed these two factors that you take longer to extubate such babies, you have a higher chance of complications because you keep them on the ventilation longer. So don't think that sedation is going to help your ventilation. It's actually negative. And uh, fentanyl is a short half-life and rapid onset of action. So for pre-medication pre or for procedural sedation, <coughs> fentanyl is better. But again, you have to stress that it has to be given very slowly because it causes chest wall rigidity. And the slowness is three to five minutes. And many times your nurses may not appreciate how long a three to five minute period is. If you have an infusion pump, it's easier to set it and put it through that small pump. But if it's three to five minutes, it's really long. If you're standing by the bedside and giving for three to five minutes, and very often we say three to five minutes, and then next second it's in and the baby is <laughs> apneic and holding the breath, and you have to rush to intubate because you can't bag such babies even with the chest wall rigidity. And it's similar to morphine, and it's uh, obviously used for acute pain relief, but use a smaller dose like two microgram, not the five microgram dose. And infusion, you have the range for it. It's more potent, much more potent than morphine. So you need only a small dose. Morphine, I usually start with five to 10 microgram. Sometimes you may need a bolus if the baby is agitated, but uh, in post-operative pain, 20 microgram is enough. Some units use 30, 40 microgram, but you don't really need that. You start getting bladder retention complications related to that and train your team not to use too much sedation. Air leak is not an indication for, uh, unless you have PPHA. You can give fentanyl for the procedure if you're doing a chest strain. So I mentioned <clears throat> midazolam is a sedative. It's not an analgesic. So invariably you need to add analgesia to it. And midazolam more than morphine, it has a significant impact on your fluid balance. So once you use midazolam, you invariably get edema. I tend to avoid it unless it's severe PPHN and give it for one or two infusions, six to 12 hours and stop it. So try to train your team to stop it early. Uh, remember that the fluid shift similar to uh, what I tell about diuretics. So don't uh, use diuretics unless it's absolutely essential because you have so many unpredictable actions of it. You cannot say where it's acting. We know that the electrolytes are the basis for your whole body function. The homeostasis from the physiology we keep learning and we can't explain it, but it has impact on the cell membrane function. We often see babies uh, suddenly developing an arrest and it could be because of the electrolyte disturbances we are causing. So don't treat, I mean, you may measure the sodium, you may correct the sodium and potassium, but there are so many unknown components of it. So don't take diuretics lightly because we cannot control every action of the diuretic. Uh, so uh, paralysis, again, very short doses or infusions, six to 12 hours, try to wean them off. Even post-operative for diaphragmatic hernia, we try to stop it by 24 hours. So uh, that's the longest you may consider a paralytic. I mean, uh, in gut surgery, you want to avoid because it causes distension. And the paralysis also affects your ability to feed. Even if you have a central line, we want to feed soon and get the babies to full feed soon. You only go step by step in the small babies. Many of you might be starting to use uh, Presidex, uh, Dexmeditomidin. So it seems to be a good medication, not enough studies in newborn, but uh, if you use it, it's probably going to be helpful. It's an alpha-2 agonist and uh, there is no inhibition of the respiratory drive. And in fact, some neuroprotective function has been shown. So you may prefer that to morphine if you have the ability, especially post-operative cases as well. Um, <coughs> In uh, therapeutic hypothermia as well, you need a little sedation, you can use uh, Presidex. And the bradycardia is a known <laughs> side effect. You start with the low dose and gradually increase if needed. So I have used it in a few cases. It's fairly safe, but 
again the same impact i mean don't use unless you need it so we also have premature babies where we are immediately giving caffeine so if you're not able to extubate such babies and especially if the ventilation is difficult you need sedation you can hold the caffeine there is no point giving a stimulant and a sedative at the same time so you restart the caffeine when you're about to extubate so don't think you have to continue the caffeine and uh, in babies sick enough to need uh, infusion of analgesic and sedative, you hold the caffeine for the period, restart. So usually the first loading dose lasts for five days, but you can give a top-up loading dose of 10 milligram per kilogram before extubation, even if it's within the five days. So remember, if a baby doesn't extubate, I don't start caffeine in the extreme premature babies in the first three, four days, because anyway, I'm not going to extubate them. If it's below 23 weeks or 24 weeks, you keep them intubated, you have a higher risk of atelic trauma. I think I've discussed this in the module on extubation, so you can go through that again. So sedation use only if essential and not as a routine and stick to the lowest uh, possible dose. Avoid uh, sedation and paralysis <laughs> if possible. Analgesia is different from sedation. So don't use sedative doses of morphine. Don't use midazolam or sedative drugs as far as you can. So this all comes to the concept of minimizing care so you don't cause complications on your own. So use. Gen allow the baby's recovery system you're supporting the physiology to recover so neonatology is very simple you just support the baby enough to recover from what they have you don't do things yourself to complicate it you bring more problems to the baby the system may not recover well so most of the time the hydrogenic problems happen more lengthier stay infection risk more procedures so everything leads to if you keep it simple Neonatology is easy in most of the cases. You do have the sick ones, but even there, you look at the pets of physiology and keep it simple. And rectal paracetamol or IV can be considered to reduce.